most of the impact that we're going to have in terms of combating climate change has probably already been invented. It kind of needs to be invented because to scale it up to sufficient levels to then create significant significant impact to then avoid a lot of what's coming, it's got to happen real damn fast or we're in trouble. And I think we have the technology to already do it if we had the kind of scale and incentives. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Clean Techies podcast, where we interview climate tech founders and VCs to discuss all things building and investing to solve the biggest challenge of our generation, climate change. This is episode 79 of the show. I'm your host, Silas Maynard, and thank you for joining us on today's episode. Before we get into the details, a note for any founders listening, as always, if you are a founder in the space seeking funding or looking for partnerships, please reach out and we will make any intros that we can. And a quick note from our sponsors, thank you to NextWave Partners for making this show possible. NextWave are experts in talent acquisition, recruitment, and retention across the climate tech, renewables, and ESG spaces globally. So if your team is growing or you are looking to make a career change, reach out to them at next-wavepartners.com or reach out to one of their consultants directly via their LinkedIn page. All right, let's get into today's episode details. So today we are joined by Matt Ward, the founder and CEO of the Forward VC Accelerator Program and host of The Startup Tank. And we covered a lot of things in today's episode. It was a really, really fun conversation that kind of fl- 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 uh, flowed really randomly as we went through it. I have a lot of notes prepared, but we kind of we didn't really stick to them too, too tightly. Um, but yeah, really, really interesting conversation from yet another individual who had no true background in climate, uh, but decided to, to make it his life. So the key topics in this conversation were um, how a mechanical engineer can build a climate tech accelerator. Obviously, that's, that's him. Um, why he chose to be part of the climate tech space and essentially his belief that how everything will be re-engineered to be carbon neutral or low carbon. And then in his words, what it takes to be a climate tech entrepreneur, pretty interesting take there. And then um, why he's very bullish on egg and food, alternative materials, and then the upcycling and recycling models, um, kind of just building those into some type of climate climate uh, tech of com- company of sorts. So really, really fun conversation, really free-flowing, as I mentioned. So uh, if you are looking for specific topics, you can find those topic time markers in the show notes if you prefer to just listen to those things that you're really searching for. So feel free to look there too. But all right, uh, let's get into the show. All right. Welcome. Welcome to the show, Matt. How are you doing today? Pretty good. How about you, Silas? I'm good. I'm good. I'm super excited for today's show. So I guess before we get into things, this is probably the best place to start is the beginning. So give us a quick introduction to yourself and a, and a little bit about what you are doing. Oh, the beginning. That's always a hard one. Um, quick introduction. Uh, studied mechanical engineering, found out fast, wasn't working for big corporates, started a couple of e-commerce media podcasts, um, built, sold those companies, spent a few years helping companies on growth, scaling product and uh, kind of uh, go to market before realizing I was I was tired of helping D2C and uh, B2B SaaS companies sell more pointless. Um, I don't know if you swear on this program, but crap. Uh, I was tired of that. I wanted to do something that mattered. About a year ago, I started Forward VC, which was initially an early stage climate syndicate. And uh, we did a couple of deals through that before transitioning into a climate accelerator. And that's kind of what I'm focused on is our uh, our partner in crime accelerator. So we're kind of the most hands-on investors and we try to be there and cheat, help companies meet the top players in the space through our connections. And then, um, yeah, make more, uh, make more good things happen on the the climate side of things. It's kind of a quick overview. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I'm curious to learn a little bit. You you mentioned that you really quickly learned that you didn't want to stay down. You said mechanical engineering was where you started and you wanted Mm -hmm. to kind of shift directions. What was your thought process like when you, because you had invested time into getting that degree and learning those things that you then had decided to go a different way. I think a lot of young people, especially I've been in this boat at times where it's like, hey, should I continue down this route? What, what do I do? How did you make the decision? Did you have a framework or anything that you used to, to come to that, that determination? So back back then, I'd, I'd always studied mechanical engineering because I was I was good at math and science and it's what my dad had done. So of course, that's what you do. And engineering is a good degree, right? I went to Georgia Tech. And then I did a couple of internships and then they were actually meant to be co-ops, which means uh, work, study, work, study, work, study. So three, three semesters of of working. And the first internship I did after about a week, I 
there was nothing that I I knew I learned pretty much everything that I was going to learn a week, two weeks, something like that. It, all that I was going to be doing in the future progressions were modeling slightly more complicated parts or modeling the landing gear of an airplane as opposed to the other pieces, et cetera. And I sent my advisor an email saying, I don't think I'm going to be coming back for the second semester. So I didn't see kind of everything was exactly the same over and over and over. And I experienced that as well in other internships that I did. I did another one where they uh, they wanted to put out a new product, a, a smaller version of a big product that they had. <laughs> the big product that they had wasn't selling Jack because it was too expensive. And the smaller product was going to be too expensive and not sell Jack either. And everyone realized it, but marketing had decided that's what we needed to do. So engineering had to create the product. And I was the one causing problems as the intern, wondering why are we doing this if we all know that it's not going to sell? And then through, through that process and through working with corporates, I did another stint with Airbus as well. And it was always just one little wheel in a much, a one large little cog in a much larger kind of wheel and system. And I didn't want to be the little cog that does the same thing every day. I wanted to, to do more than that. And there's a great piece of advice. I don't remember who I heard it from, but don't take advice from people who aren't living the kind of life that you want to live. If they're not further along on the journey than you want to be, then whatever advice they're giving you is either the advice to live their life or the advice to avoid their life. But either way, it's not super relevant for the journey you want, unless they are further down that journey than you are. Mm -hmm. Now, that is really, I think it's really helpful. I hope a lot of people take that to heart because it is difficult, especially for a lot of young people I've encountered. They, they want to work in climate. They sometimes have no idea what it really, like what they can actually do in climate and that they might be having mentors that may not be aligned with them. So I think that's hopefully pretty helpful for some people. Um, I want to talk about you. So you obviously, you said at some point you were just kind of done selling bullshit and you wanted to do something, something interesting, but did you know that that was going to be climate right away? Had you always had this interest in climate? How did you come up with that uh, specific journey? So I've thought a lot in the past about what the kind of biggest problems in the world are worth solving. And I mean, people have thought about it as well. They kind of call it ES and G, the environment, um, societal and governments. In my opinion, E is at least exponentially more important than S and G, because if we screw up the societal side of things, we're basically living in the world we're living in today. If we screw up the governance side of things, we're basically living in the world we're living in today. Just look at Elon Musk and Twitter and Tesla. I, I think that the biggest problem for all of us to solve, regardless of everything else, we can get the other things wrong and the world more or less stays the same. There, there are troubles. We're not, we don't have an equal world. There's a lot of issues that people suffer around the world, but we don't have tens or hundreds of millions of people dying, massive wars, um, nuclear war, famines, refugee status, resource wars, etc. Unless the kind of climate all goes to, to shit as it's anticipated to. And we don't react to that. So I decided, let's choose the biggest problem that for me is the most meaningful, where I can make the most impact. And I, it's also the area I find the most interesting. And then I would be lying if I didn't say, there's also the ego factor of, it feels good to be able to say you're trying to do something that's good for the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, it, I think it plays into a lot. And sometimes people are cynical because of that. Um, but I also think that the people who are realistic about it realize that these are problems that need to be solved. But also on the other hand, it's like, there's a, there's also an alignment. And there's also money to be made to do these things, right? You solve these problems. You're you're making people's lives better, and you know you're getting rewarded for for doing it as well. So I think it's a really fascinating space for that reason. I have a kind of similar similar interest as well. Um, I want to talk about. I guess I, I don't know where we should go next. Maybe perhaps it would be helpful to have you define the, the different. You mentioned a few things. Some people may not be super familiar with the the differences of an accelerator. Uh, a venture studio, a VC, kind of, could you break down these kind of key factors and the key players in the climate tech eco space and then our ecosystem and then where you fit into that exactly? Yes, absolutely. And if you're trying to get a big overview of what that climate space looks like, just forward.vc slash VC database, we basically have a database of 850 plus funds, incubators, accelerators, and CVCs. You can filter by stage, sector, geography, et cetera, to understand the entire system. But basically what it boils down to is let's say you're a founder, you want to start a business. Either you do it on your own or you go into like an incubator program where they kind of help you come up with the business and the idea and shape things together. Once you graduate from an incubator, which generally is not giving you cash, maybe they're giving you some office space or some mentorship, but that's about it. Then you would get into kind of an accelerator program. That's your traditional Y Combinator, Tech Stars, 500 Startups, etc. And the idea behind that 
at least the idea behind that in the past was, let's really accelerate the business. Let's get you to a much further along stage so that you're attractive for investors. Let's go from kind of this early product to significantly more traction so that we can raise some money and really, really kick things off. I noticed a bit of a gap in there, which I'll get back to in a sec, but that just problems being accelerators, normally large cohorts, bring in 10, 20, 50 companies at a time, which means you care somewhere between two to 10% about each company. It was more a model of indexing the market. Let's to be totally frank here. And then there are VCs. So VCs are generally, they're more professionalized than angel investors. An angel investor might write you a check like 10, 50, 100K into your company in an early round, a pre-seed, a friends and family. Then as you get further along, that's where venture capitalists come in. And they're look the ones who are looking for massive upside. So 50, 100, 1,000x type numbers. Those are kind of what they have to be able to see your company being able to do because otherwise it won't make the fund um, economics work for them because so many companies will fail, will not make it. So those those VCs, then you go through the pre-seed, seed, series A, series B, et cetera, et cetera. And then you kind of get along to, I guess the last player in the space would really be like corporates or CVCs. And that's a, that's a corporate company like Google Ventures is from Google, but they're funded from, by Google. And there would be kind of the later stage players in that space. And that's kind of what the ecosystem looks like. There's lots of incubators, there's lots of accelerators, there's lots of VCs. One thing that I noticed, so I run the startup tank, which is, it's a climate shark tank or Dragon's Den. You guys can check it out. You could pitch if you want. We do it every two weeks. It's just the startuptank.com. What I found from seeing all of those companies and what we were doing with Forward was, why are so many of these companies going through multiple accelerator programs and still trying to raise a seed round and get actual traction? And it just kind of made me wonder because accelerators are supposed to be hands-on. They're supposed to be helpful. They're supposed to help you get somewhere. And I think over time, they kind of lost that and became more focused on perfecting the pitch deck and trying to help you with a raise and get in front of a demo day of dentist, et cetera, et cetera. It seems like the accelerators, some of them, there are some great ones out there. I will say that. But a lot of them seem to be failing on that side. And then there's the VCs. And what VCs? VCs basically say, we're founder friendly. We're super connected. We're going to be incredibly helpful when we connect and then, or when we invest, then they invest. And then it's kind of crickets until like board meetings or trying to, trying to push the founder. So when I was building, I was building forward VC, we got up to a pretty decent size as a climate syndicate. And the big problem with running a syndicate is it's, it's like herding cats to cat food. Even when we had incredible investments we wanted to do, maybe our investors were busy or Putin decided to invade Russia or they were getting a divorce or they didn't see the email or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we didn't know if we were deploying 500,000 or 25,000 into a company, mm -hmm. which just was not feasible. So I'd been looking at, okay, I, I want to start a fund. I want to make this into something that's more sustainable, more long-term, but I'm also the type of person who's a bit over the top of when I do something, I do it all out. So I was pu I'd putting together this entire program. I've been connecting the past year for 1300 funds, incubators, accelerators, CVCs, hundreds more corporates. I put together kind of an outreach template and everything that I would just give the companies I would invest in and then realize, hmm, this is kind of an accelerator. This is an accelerator with me as your, your partner in crime, literally the person there with you, one to two new companies a month. And that's kind of where our accelerator came from. And that's why we call it the partner in crime program, because you need someone who's actually on your side batting for you, who's 100% invested in what you're doing, not, well, you're one of 30 or 50 portfolio companies. So if it works out, well, then that's awesome. And if it doesn't, well, we've got 49 others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it is interesting. I, I just kind of curious because you, you've touched on a lot of things here. And I, I've always been curious about what the big bottlenecks are in the space, because I know that there's some people who say there's not enough money going into seed. Obviously, we all know that VCs, especially those who are coming from traditional VC going into climate, may not quite have the right alignment or they're just they're just here for the money. They're not necessarily they don't understand the, the rest of the, the needs there. So what are the bottlenecks in your mind, aside from like you've already mentioned, getting people, getting these these early stage companies in front of in front of investors and that that kind of accelerator model. What are the other bottlenecks? Even more so than that, getting them in front of companies and getting them clients. So that's actually the focus of our program, and that's why I recommend startups to focus is get customers. If you have traction, if you have pilots, you have a few things working, everything else lines up. Investors will chase you down. The 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 um, I think it was Sequoia when they invested in WhatsApp, they were literally stalking the founders and going to their apartment trying to find them so that they could invest into the company. If you get the business working, then 
everything else falls into place. One of the areas where I think is challenging is right now, a well, right now specifically with uh, war plus kind of economy tanking, all all companies want to go green and they want to be sustainable. They want to be able to have that, but it's something they want. It's not something they necessarily need. They kind of make these big proclamations, et cetera. But when push comes to shove, profit trumps impact for them. And let's just be honest, that's how it is. So the the companies really need a help on kind of a regulatory side of things with uh, carbon credits and or carbon taxes, preferably carbon taxes, in my opinion, but that's a the kind of a debate well, we could see what happens there but they they need the push from governments to get um, companies to have to act consumers pushing for um, companies to act more sustainably and then the companies also need a lot of you see kind of two types of founders in climate maybe three one um a spin out of a university or someone who's really deep in the technology side of things and they've invented or created something incredible and have absolutely no idea how to make a business out of it. You have the serial founder who's built and sold or done something else in the past, and now they want what their work to be something meaningful for the future. They're generally the ones who are kind of in the best position because they have the business experience and then can also bring in the, the technical experience as well. And then you've got folks who are just trying to get into the space because they want to build a business and wouldn't it be great if it was a climate-focused business? And all, all those folks need different things, but... More than anything else, they kind of need that those entrances into the market, and they need that they need that pull. So, like with carbon, there's a lot of companies that are either creating carbon credits or creating carbon markets, etc. But those are all really artificial markets right now. It's all kind of made up, and people putting money in for projects to kind of offset their emissions to kind of look like they are being climate responsible, even if. They're actually still having to burn lots of coal, but because we bought some extra trees here in Uganda and Kenya, we're uh, we're climate neutral. I think we've got to get around that a little bit. We've got to have a bit more maturity in the space for some of the um, climate founders. And then I think there's a challenge as well, because in the past, in the long distant past, venture capital was meant to be about very risky bets. And there was tons of money put in so that you could get to where you needed to get to. Then the internet kind of started to change things, AWS, um, hosting, and all VCs realized, hmm, we can still kind of play the same game, but we can play it with much less risk because this is just a software product. We make software, the margins are infinite, it doesn't take a lot of money, et cetera, et cetera, quick exits. That's the opposite of hardware and climate tech. Climate tech and hardware, it's big, it's dirty, it's hard. It's infrastructure, it takes a long time, it takes a lot of money. The margins aren't like software. So all of that speaks to the the traditional easy model of VC being much more much more challenging on a, on a long-term perspective. That's part of the reason why I need to think about what I can say here. It's part of the reason why when I recommend to folks that want to start a climate fund, I recommend an evergreen fund because having a longer term time horizon means you don't have to force the founders after eight or 10 years to give up on the business and IPO exit or get acquired. You can have longer term time horizons, which you can't have with a traditional 10 and two VC model. So if I was ever thinking about a VC fund, I would think about an evergreen fund. That's what I can say about that. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's really interesting. I think we, when you look at, especially some of the things that have happened, at least in the US and in the VC space over the co past couple of years, especially with just absolutely insane valuations. And now these things are coming back down. It's almost like the, the people are really just covering their eyes to the incentives that they all have to like, Hey, we need to keep, keep this up because the VCs and the, and who had funded the first rounds, they don't want it to be a down round, right? They want to keep growing things. And there's just there's, there's a misalignment of incentives along the way and somebody is going to be left holding the bag. And I think that people need to to find a way to make those alignments a little bit better or just be more reasonable. I know everybody wants that big outsized bet, but if you go and you push these things too far, then before you know it, you break it. And I think that that's something I've heard a lot of people to comment about is the pressures that VCs put on can tend to really frustrate them, especially when they're a climate tech company you know, and maybe they have some some less aware climate tech VCs or, or VCs that aren't necessarily specifically focused on climate. So that is interesting. Um, I was going to ask you actually about your your opinion on for somebody starting uh, interested in starting a fund in the space, because there is still a need for capital. I mean, there's quite a lot of it, but there's always more more going to be needed. What are your advice 
what would your advice be to people who are looking to do that other than creating an evergreen fund? What are some of the other things that you've noticed? Depends on their, depends on their background, depends on their network. I mean, I think, I think you've got to have a pretty specific kind of focus or thesis for folks that just want to have a traditional fund because just having a traditional fund means you're competing you're competing to be the the capital of choice for someone. That's not what we do with our accelerator. We're, comp- I mean, our goal is really to cheat. We invest in the companies. We introduce them to ideally hundreds of companies through our hundred plus mentors and then my network. And then they get a bunch of new customers, pilots, traction, et cetera. So they're worth much more. So we can kind of cheat and be very valuable to the companies. But for people that want to start a fund, you've got to figure out how you're going to be valuable and how you're going to find the right companies to invest in. I think those two things are are pretty critical. It, if you're thinking about getting into the space, it's incredibly challenging if you want to join a fund because let, let's just think about it. AVC is kind of one of the most sought after professions that exists out there. You're making investments into cool founders. You're getting paid pretty well to do it. And you have massive upside. Now on the climate side of things, it's even more extreme because now you also get to feel like a good person doing it. So that's kind of like, that's kind of like the absolute overlap of whatever those two circles are called of cool jobs. So to be able to do that, I think you got to find a good way to hack your, hack your way into it. For me, that was the startup tank that was building when I built with Forward VC and our our syndicate that was, was literally spending the last year with like pro- probably reaching out to yeah 15, 13, 1500 funds, incubators, accelerators, CVCs, another several thousand investors, probably hundred to maybe a thousand or so uh, corporates, and really just trying to be as helpful as possible, sharing deals, um, making connections, and being the person who kind of gave all of the karma to hope that the karma comes back. And that would be my question for you is how do you create that for yourself? Is it a community? Is it maybe you just have rich friends and you can kind of start the fund as a family office and then expand it into something more. Maybe you join an existing fund. Maybe you look at partnering with someone who has an accelerator or someone who has an audience or someone who's in, in the space already. It's how can you hack yourself into that into where you want to be and do you have to start a fund or is your goal just to be in the space this would be another question i would have if it's just to be in the space i would recommend joining an existing fund it's much easier and it's going to be much less of a headache for you if you're kind of someone who's stubborn like me or kind of does things your own way like calling calling your accelerator a partner in crime program then uh maybe you've got to do it your own way and come up, Mm -hmm. up with your own strategy yeah fair enough um I'm also really curious about how you vet people because if you're look if you're working very um you know you said I think you said two companies a month uh, at maximum yeah. uh, we bring in one to two new a month yeah one to two new a month how do you vet who you're going to bring in like what are the key things that you look for and then after we go uh, on that I want to go through the process what it looks like for them kind of step by step mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of the three T's model so team tam timing. So Tam, we want to see something that's billions, multi-billions, ideally, and either growing very, very quickly or often even better, absolutely enormous and possibly declining, but it's an outdated prime for disruption industry like uh, construction, et cetera. Um, Timing. So why is it possible now, but wasn't possible, doable, or kind of appealing two, three, four years ago? Because if it was, why is no one doing it? Uh, that might be a sign. And then team, which is the wild card and most important. And that is in venture, you have winners and you have everyone else. And it's what about this team, this founder, et cetera, is, excuse the French, but effing extraordinary. Something about them, you would bet on them no matter what. They're a winner. They're an overachiever. They ran a marathon on a broken leg, a refugee, or put themselves through night school or something about them. And their reason behind this is kind of it kind of gives you like the little tingles. I would say those are the those are the big three. We also like to see defensibility. So whether that be IP, uh, network effects, moats, et cetera, if they build this business, what's going to allow them to prevent other people from just coming in and, and ripping it off? Those would be the the biggest kind of factors that we like to see. And then I, I have a bit of a controversial opinion when it comes to founders, but I think two of the most important characteristics of founders and Yeah, I mean, I might as well just say it. Ignorance and arrogance. You've got to be ignorant enough to think that you can do something that's essentially impossible. And you've got to be arrogant enough so when people that tell you otherwise or think they know better, 
tell you that you can't, you either politely or not so politely tell them to F off and you're going to do it anyways. I think some combination of that, because otherwise you don't get massive outcomes. Otherwise you don't get big change. I used to be a big fan of Elon Musk because he was like that before po the power went to his head. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, now not so much a fan, but kind of that belief of F it, we're going to make an electric car F it. We're going to make a, a a rocket that lands twice because otherwise it's too expensive to, to send things into space or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That kind of mindset of pushing the, you know, first principle speaking, uh, thinking, so to speak. Mm -hmm. One thing I'm curious about is, is always for somebody who's non-technical, I don't have a technical background and, and an interest in this space is you talked about these people who might have come out of a university who have probably a great technology, don't know how to commercialize it, or former founders of other conventional companies or non-climate companies who are interested, et cetera. You've got these different types of people and they probably both have individual challenges. Like the commercial person who's founded another company can maybe go and find the talent, the technical stuff. But usually from what I've seen that the really, really interesting climate tech companies have some type of like science breakthrough of some sort, some type of R&D mm -hmm. process that they're taking either from a national labs that's just sitting on a shelf getting dusty or they've come up with themselves. So what do you see and how people are, or are there ways that you help these in, these different types of, of founders find the other person, kind of their, their Robin Hood to their Batman to really go out and do it? Because maybe I'm kind of having a, a, an incorrect assumption here, but my understanding is that there has to be that, that technical breakthrough to some extent to really make something very interesting at climate. I would say yes and no. I don't think you have to have that. I, but I think you have to have the right combination of of talent, expertise, network, et cetera. I think having that is often good. But one thing that we see a lot are existing technologies that have been used in other applications that are now being brought in, like um, like pyrolyzers, gasification, et cetera, and then creating the business model that works with that or bringing together two separate things that weren't normally done. And suddenly, suddenly pairing that innovation together. I mean, we will try to f help founders find a co-founder, find the right person. Generally, they're a little bit further along when they're when they're entering our program. It's generally they've got a product, an MVP, or slightly further, maybe a couple of customers. And our goal is really acceleration. We're helping them take the that product, take the and get sales, get traction, get further along in the business, business side of things. Because in my opinion, nothing else matters. If you get that, everything works. And if you don't get that, nothing does. But how I would kind of advise founders is, A, I mean, there's a lot of great Slack communities. There's a lot of great places online to look. Create the create the LinkedIn job description of kind of the co-founder you're looking for. Ask your network if they know XYZ type of person who's great with sales or connected here or has the kind of technical chops to build anything, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I would say long-term, most of the impact that we're going to have in terms of combating climate change has probably already been invented. It kind of needs to be invented because to scale it up to sufficient levels to then create significant, significant impact to then avoid a lot of what's coming, it's got to happen real damn fast or we're in trouble. And I think we have the technology to already do it if we have the kind of scale and incentives in place. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's very really interesting. I, I've not heard that take before, so I, I do appreciate that a little bit different, something I've never heard before. I wanted to go back before we overlook it is what does the process look like when people join your accelerator? What are the step-by-step -step kind of process? How long does it usually last? And again, what... You said they're usually at a certain stage. What stage are they usually at? And then we can just kind of go from there. Mm -hmm. It depends a little bit. So we'll take in pre-seed and we'll take in seed stage companies. We'll even take in some companies that are further along, but just decide to join the program and still take our terms because they know kind of what we can bring to the table from network um, traction. We've we've got a hundred plus mentors at uh, top CVCs, VCs, accelerators, corporates, governments, et cetera that aren't traditional mentors. It's not, Hey, let's come in and let me give you advice about the horror stories of when I was being a CEO. It's, 
the founders say, hey, here's what I'm doing here, the challenges I'm having here, are the type of people I'm trying to meet. Oh, I know folks over at General Mills. I know folks over at BMW, Porsche, uh, JetBlue, HSBC, et cetera, et cetera. Let me make some warm intros because warm intros are kind of, it's worth like a thousand cold outreaches. But in terms of what the process looks like, company supply for us, for our accelerator and or for the startup tank, sometimes I'll just opportunistically ask folks if they might be interested in that. And if they if they kind of check all the boxes, we go through the interview process, we go through the application process, and it's somebody that we want to have and we think, like we said, are going to be one of those winners, then we bring them into the program. The program lasts three months, so 12 weeks, and every week is, is pretty hands-on. It's a combination of content, um, emails, access to our networks, access to my databases, et cetera, where they're asking for intros plus additional introductions that I'm making, plus things like our sales and outreach templates. So I've done a lot in terms of sales and cold outreach in the past. And I basically just give the templates that I have for myself and for startups to all the people in our program and say, okay, now go reach out to 20 to 50 of these type of folks. Let's see what kind of traction we get so we can try to build not only that initial push of customers through our network and through our our people, but also kind of the model that will help you with creating a scalable customer acquisition channel in the future. We've got folks on board who help with uh, non-dilutive grant funding. So basically finding the, the grants that would be applicable for them, coming up with a strategy of how they can apply for that, uh, outsourced CFO who helps them with the business kind of numbers modeling so that they can have their two, three, five-year plan and story and make that align with the actual overall pitch and story of the business itself. And then we shift the second half of the program into, okay, let's get some investors. We've got some traction. We've built the pipeline. We've got some things happening. Here's how here's how you reach out to investors. Here's our database, our unfiltered database with emails, LinkedIn's, et cetera. Um, tell me who you want introductions to. I'm going to make intros. You go reach out to another X number of those. Let's see what we can get in terms of traction. Let's get you on the startup tank. That'll be like our online demo day. It's not your traditional bunch of dentists are going to be there to throw some checks around and you got the massive FOMO, but it's going to get you out there and in front of the world and let's try to close this round. And well, yeah, within two to three months, two to five X markup, you're kind of happy, we're happy. And then at that point, you're no longer in the program. You're not, you're, but you're still part of the family. You're just not living in the house is what I like to say. So when you need something I'm here, our mentors are here, and we're going to kick our kick ass to make sure we can be helpful. But it's not like it's going to be every day we're, we're making dinner for you kind of deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, that's really interesting, really straightforward. I think it's it's really interesting how it's, I think the the punchiness of it is something that I appreciate. I think a lot of, a lot of at least I've seen a lot of these companies around there may not take into account the speed aspect and how important that is. So I think it's really interesting to see what you're doing there. Um, you talked about some of the things like, you know, templates and marketing and things like that, just kind of branding. What are some of the biggest things that usually when people come into your program that they really need to level up on? Is it usually just getting customers or are there other things that tend to be overlooked uh, by a lot of the people entering the program? Um, I mean, in my opinion, getting customers and perfecting the product are kind of the two most important things. So we help as well with the perfecting of the product, kind of my 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 Bible is how to win friends and influence people. And it's really a great guide on how to manipulate, to create kind of virality, to create traction by getting people what they want. So we bring that a lot into the products of helping our helping the companies. Maybe it's designing their marketplace to be to have the right, oh, here's here's the time to pop up and say, by the way, we just uh we just I can't really tell you about that company yet. By the way, we just did X, X, Y, Z and uh, we look good. And this is why we want to share it on Facebook. Like thinking about the incentives that people have to get them to do certain things and then positioning that into the product. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would say for companies entering the program, they generally enter the program looking for two things, growth and investment. And our goal is to get them both in as short a time as possible. So that they're 10 steps further along when they go through the program as opposed to one or half. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Well, one thing I'm curious about, you you mentioned this, and I, I find this really interesting personally, because I'm, I'm really interested in this model, is you've connected with so many people, including VCs, other corporates, and things just like companies that might be interested in purchasing. That one to me is really interesting. A lot of people are able to make a list of VCs and build build warm uh, connections there, but some of the actual potential customers tend to be a little more difficult. What do you think about the partnership model in general? Do you see, uh, do you have ways of collecting revenue from that yourself and how you guys run your model for your, for your accelerator? Oh, that would and- be lovely right now. Right now we don't, maybe in, maybe in the future we'll do something like that. I think it's, it's beneficial and it does create some synergies. It creates some it creates some issues as well. It's something that we'll probably do in the future. A lot of what we're doing as well is uh, with our mentors, a lot of them are at larger corporates or CVCs, et cetera. And we bring in people where they can be helpful, but even more so them being in the program can be helpful to them so that they can a win karma by um, helping our companies with introductions. So the companies feel like they owe them. And then B more importantly, maybe they're scouting for their own fund and want to do the seed or the series A, or they're scouting for their company for innovation, or I'm working over at general in the mills, but I, my buddy's working over here at, I don't know, Exxon. And this is the perfect thing for me to send them. Basically they get to win on both sides and get the karma points of making the connections. And that's by bringing in those type of people and bringing them in at top corporates then we can kind of make those connections artificially through the not official channels because the official channels just don't work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's something I've always interested in understanding is how these, because my understanding is there's a lot of corporates that are definitely interested in, in purchasing things if they can find the right thing. But again, it has to be kind of a financially correct for them. So do you see that these corporates, are, are there people who are dedicated to identifying these type of things? Or does it have to be kind of like pushed in front of their face in order for them to see it? And it, in a sense, tends to be a little difficult, like this Both. Kind of par- partnership person. Both. There are people who are kind of supposed to do that. But if, think about how many companies get started and how many get funded. There's no human on earth that knows every company that gets mm-hmm. started or funded. So I would say even just having that role, our job is, our job pure and simple is let's get XYZ startup in front of, ABC corporate where we think XYZ startup could be super helpful for them. And let's have hopefully kind of a champion with uh, the corporate who can get a pilot set up and then it's on the company to just deliver. And if they can deliver and it's valuable for the company and XYZ product or whatever will help them with decarbonizing or hitting their goals or boosting profits or whatever, then they're going to continue that. And if it's not, then it's not, but then if it's not, it's not a business anyways. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about your outlook on different areas or different verticals within the space. What are some of the key things, key places that you're keeping an eye on that you're really fascinated by? If you want to talk about any of the, the companies you guys have worked with that you can, I'd be just kind of keen to open this can. Ugly, dirty, and non-sexy are the sexy spaces for climate tech investing, to be honest. So construction probably trumps everything else. Big, ugly, it's massive carbon emitter. Food is is pretty big, the the food ecosystem. People know that. It's been there's been a lot of investment already into the space though. I'm not that big on plant-based meat because then it's a marketing competition and a D2C battle of who can have the best branding because the, the tastes aren't going to be all that different. I I think um lab grown meat or cell-based meat will be a breakthrough. Once we have that to the point where it's close to price parity, you're pretty much gonna have to be a bad person to eat the burger where a cow got killed. And I think once we get to that point, you will have a complete shift over. I think until we get to that point, it's going to take some time. Hence why veganism hasn't really grown more than, I, I mean, it's 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 still relatively fringe. Um, in terms of other spaces, alternative mir- materials, very big on materials that are lower, uh, lower carbon footprint or um, kind of uh, an upcycle or recycle model where the, the products are circular being reused see a lot of interesting things happening, especially in the the plastics and the disposable space and the like food packaging or um, food box like delivery steel where they're trying to reuse the packaging. The challenge being there though is everyone's kind of trying to do the same thing and it's a it's an infrastructure play. You've got to have the the scale. You've got to be the one who can deliver and deal with everyone. Otherwise you're not a very valuable solution. And to do that, you've also got to be able to beat everyone and your solution's not that differentiated versus others. Um, 
There's a lot of cool stuff happening on the battery side of things. We invested in a company that I can talk about, Exion. Um, lithium ion batteries are problematic. They're super expensive. They're environmentally terrible, the, the mining for cobalt and lithium. And that they, they last about a thousand cycles before they start to degrade, which is why your cell phone a year or two later lasts like half as long. Um, the company we invested in, Exion, it's a spin out uh, of a battery tech um, development from a Wiseman Institute in Israel. They can do 30,000 cycles. So your battery essentially never gets lower. It continues to have the same capacity. And most excitingly, it charges 100 times faster. So you could charge your Tesla in eight minutes instead of eight hours kind of deal, which changes everything when it comes to e-mobility and transportation. Bird did a study they could get rid of 65% of their scooters if they implemented these batteries because that's how much time is literally wasted transporting and charging the scooters. They wouldn't need them if the, the scooters charged in two minutes. And you would never think about range anxiety with an EV because when's the last time you had range anxiety with your gas-powered car? Never. You pull off on the highway, you fill up, you pee, and you're on your way. The same is true if you can charge 100 times faster. And that fixes a lot of the problems. So that's that's one area and space that we're super excited about in general. Um, in general, EVs not super attractive or exciting. Same with e-mobility, just because there is so much investment that's gone into the space. And my personal theory is... The world is going two ways when it comes to products. There's Apple and there's Android. There's the fancy expensive thing that you care a lot about. And then for everything else, you just want the kind of generic vanilla. If you're a skier, you want the best skis, the best ski goggles, the best, et cetera. And then everything else is basically toilet paper. You couldn't give two, you couldn't give two shits what brand it is. I don't care what my table is. I don't care what my couch, my this, my that, my food, my et cetera. But the things I do care about, I care a lot about. And I think that that's a, that's a problem that you're going to have in the mobility and the transportation space is I think it's going to be commoditized and become more of a, a fleet-based model, a service-based model. And in that case, I don't really care as long as I get from A to B in the cheapest way possible. And that's why Uber and Lyft and everything that happened there, so much money was burned because people didn't really care what the brand was. They could switch between them and they just wanted to get from A to B in the cheapest, fastest way possible. Um, other areas that I think are super interesting, there's a lot of stuff happening in carbon capture. I'm not sure what exactly will be the winner. I think it's an interesting space. I think it's a hard space as well, unless you have some kind of business model that works besides just selling carbon credits, because the carbon credits are still very much a, a theoretical business model, relying on kind of better nature to succeed. Um, circular economy, I find, I find fascinating and like reduction of waste. So we invested in MycoCycle. They're mushrooms that eat waste from the construction and demolition industry, and they turn it into new raw material. So that's just about as circular as it gets. And that raw material then goes into building and construction. So that kind of stuff is very cool. They, and it only works because they get paid to eat the garbage and then they get paid to sell the new product. So you get paid on both sides of the equation as opposed to cutting down more trees or more, et cetera, et cetera. All of those are places that I see um, a lot of growth, a lot of potential. But in general, I would say we are basically have to rewrite and recreate the entire infrastructure and economy of the world. There's never been a bigger opportunity. It's basically everything. And mm -hmm. so basically everything is a climate problem. And there's going to be tons of money poured into the space as governments start to put in more money, as carbon credits and taxes start to come into place, as LPs start to decide to focus on kind of the things that matter and divest out of fossil fuels, more VCs and investors come into the space, consumers push for it. One big challenge that we see, though, is all of those are big pools of capital. And big pools of capital move slow and they move with big checks because, well, I'd rather run a $100 million fund or write a $10 million check because I get paid more to do that. I have higher management fees. So simple. So you'll have lots of later stage investment and lots of funding there, essentially unlimited dumb money to grow and scale. But you've got to get over that initial hump, that initial early stage, pre-seed, seed, kind of the first three, four or five years. And if you can do that, and you're one of the ones who comes out the other side, you'll have un unlimited dumb money to build the super mega climate unicorns of tomorrow because everyone else will have kind of died in the valley of uh, the valley of climate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's quite interesting. W one thing uh, I feel like you, you, since you're very interested in the space, you'd have some thoughts on this one is on the construction space. Um, do you see that, in your opinion, the future will be a lot of kind of fixing the existing ways we do things like 
people talk a lot about decarbonizing concrete, or do you think that there's going to be people just like shift the mentality and start building things differently with different types of materials and completely shift the model, um, which again, has a little bit of a barrier to change, but w- what are your thoughts on how that will actually play out, for example, in, in construction? Um, I would say in general, defaults are very, very strong. What you you have? What do you have? An iPhone or an Android? iPhone. When was the last time you used a browser other than Safari? I actually always use Chrome. <laughs> okay, Chrome. Not even Brave. You use Chrome. Oh, you got to get Brave. Trust me. That is a pro tip. It blocks everything, so everything goes much faster. I've saved like days on my computer just because I have Brave on there, and it blocks all the cookies and scripts that need to to load. But anyways, in general, with most people, maybe not you, the default is basically what you do. You brush your teeth at night. You uh, sleep in basically the same pajamas. You buy basically the same things. You use whatever's on your phone, you et cetera, et cetera. If you've got junk in your house, you're going to stay fat. If you don't have junk in your house, it's pretty easy to be thin. The default is very important. And the default here is kind of what we already know. So I think it's probably going to be more on the decarbonization of what we already know, combined with possibly other other changes. I mean, obviously, there will be new alternative materials. So not just lower carbon or no carbon concretes, but different types of materials being used and being implemented. The other side of um, decarbonization of construction that's awesome is, like I said, Microcycle, things where, well, when you do need to break down a building, if you can have something that eats the building as opposed to kind of landfilling it, then there's pretty big implications there as well. Yeah, and I, I do, yeah I do think it's interesting because, uh, again, maybe you find a new technology, but getting an entire industry, you, you, you'd have to upskill the entire industry or change the entire industry to get it to change versus you can just say, hey, here's a better product that you can just implement into your existing processes. So I do think it's interesting. I also always try to encourage people to break their mentality of what, how things are done now is the way they have to be in the future. But that's, mm-hmm. again, that's, that's difficult. And the adoption curve doesn't, doesn't uh, lend nicely to that. So, um, okay. A couple last things to just wrap up here. What, what are your thoughts on, or what are you seeing on in terms of, I guess you would say talent in the space or also for people, you know, is, is there a lot of necessity for people to get certain types of education? I know I'm not, I'm not big on university. I didn't go to university. I know it's good for some people, but I think that it's a little bit overblown, at least in the U.S. So I'm just kind of curious to hear your thoughts on talent and education and what you think the future of that is going to be in relation to climate. Education is incredibly overblown and overpriced in the U.S. It's ridiculous. Um, if you do want to do college, pretty much go anywhere else in the world and you'll get an equal degree, but it'll cost you significantly less as much as like a thousand times less. Um, That's what I would recommend. I think in general, for a lot of things in climate and in startups in general, you don't necessarily need a specific education. You want to be a programmer, go do programming courses. You don't have to go to a university Um, for certain things. So like engineering, your medical things in the education field, you're going to have trouble doing that without, or deep tech and deep science, you're going to have trouble doing that without a university degree. But that doesn't mean you can't work in climate because every, I mean, if you've ever started a startup or you know anything about a startup, you know that pretty much for the first several years, you're a jack of all trades doing just about everything and whatever the hell that needs to be done, be that customer service or pitching to investors or designing the product or making new packaging or shipping or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's very easy for you to join a startup and get involved into the space without having a, a deeply technical background or being kind of remotely there. Maybe you've got a finance background. Great. Startups and companies need help on the, the finance side. Maybe you've got a legal background. Perfect, because you still need to manage IP, et cetera. Basically, pretty much whatever your background is, you can get involved. And with pretty much any startup, if you're willing to bust your ass and hustle, they're willing to give you a spot, even if it's kind of an unpaid internship where you kind of prove your worth and then they don't want to get rid of you after, so they hire you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. W- what percentage of the roles that your participants are hiring for tend to be like super technical in nature versus um, just like, hey, we need a hustler? I would say it's much more the hustler side because most people that start these companies are super technical and then need help figuring out the actual human and business side <laughs> of things, if we're being totally honest. Interesting. Yeah, that is that is interesting to see. Um, very good. And if well, they, yeah, if they need and if they need help on the technical side, it's much less on the super deep tech products, etc. Side, it's more on the kind of computer science front end, uh, web app or 
the the the, the tech product side of things the not the core pro, not the core of what they're doing but like for instance let's say you've got an ai algorithm to evaluate the favorability of different types of materials and different locations for construction etc you you might have all your algorithms and everything built but you need someone to make it so that a human can use it and not an ai ml uh, machine learning person mm -hmm. yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense i think um there's a lot of talk i obviously my day job is working in town so I, there's a lot of people asking like how do i get into the space and i think a lot of it comes down to just being able to sell yourself, right? You can't just apply to a job and expect uh, everybody to be interested in you. You have to really like go out if you want to prove yourself, if you don't have the direct skill set that they're looking for and prove yourself when you're, when you're pitching yourself to them. But uh, very good. Well, this has been really great. Any final thoughts that you want to close us off with? I mean, a couple, not really final thoughts, but just resources for folks. So our goal has been to be as helpful as possible and put as much karma into the universe and hope it comes back. So we've got some stuff for you guys. Um, at Forward VC, so forward.vc slash VC database, you can get our entire VC database, filterable stage sector geography check size to find your ideal investor. It's like 850 on there, funds, incubators, accelerators, et cetera. We've got a climate founder Slack on a forward VC as well. You can join. There's about 800 climate founders in there. Great place to network. Another one for climate investors. And if you're looking to um, if you're looking to raise funding or pitch, and either you want to be part of our partner in crime program or pitch on the sh the startup tank, which is which is a Dragon's Den or a Shark Tank, we do every every other week. That's the the startuptank.com. You can find more information there. And if anyone's just kind of interested in what we're doing, wants to get in, involved or learn more about the accelerator, then uh, I'm just Matt at forward.vc. Awesome. Very good. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on and uh, really excited for what you guys are doing. And I think, uh, again, obviously it's an exciting space to be in. So we're, we're both uh, pumped about this, but thanks again. And we'll see you probably another time on the show. I'd love to have you on again. Awesome. And one clarification just for folks, because I've got this as a question. So forward VC is not an ego thing. It's we invest in companies that move the world forward. It's not just because my last name is Ward. I got that <laughs> and uh, just randomly thought of that. But anyways... Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that is, that, that, that is, uh, it is an interesting thing. It's something I was like, oh, I wonder if he named it that way or if he, you know, did some brand name exercises, but no, it's pretty, it's a pretty cool uh, name to be honest. Yeah. It's uh it's, it's decent. Like my, my sister actually made me a shirt. She's, uh, it's cool though. But anyways, thanks for, thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening guys. Hope this was helpful. And if there's anything I can be helpful with in the future, introductions, et cetera. Yeah. Be sure to reach out. All right. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please do share it with somebody who might find it interesting uh, and leave a review. We really appreciate that. Uh, it does help grow the show significantly more than you believe. Uh, then definitely consider reaching out and connecting with Matt and check out their website, especially if you're a, a founder in the space looking for help and you need to get some quick traction. Really highly encourage you to look at uh, being, a, being a participant in their accelerator programs. As, a, as you heard, it's a very, very punchy program. So it could probably help you get quite a lot of traction. Uh, and then if this is your first time, please do subscribe and tap the bell for notifications in order to follow us on our journey. You can follow me on LinkedIn or Twitter, wherever you want. Just always glad to interact with everybody. Um, love to continue learning about the space from people in the space. And a quick note for our next show, we will be joined by John Shigarian, the co-founder and CEO of ERI. And we're, what they're doing at ERI is they are essentially handling the recycling and destruction of electronics and other items. Um, he's, he's also the author of a book called The Insecurity of Everything. And the conversation, it covers how cybersecurity and climate tech intersect, which I thought was pretty interesting. Never really thought I'd think about that. Uh, we also talked about his advice to aspiring climate tech entrepreneurs. He has a pretty interesting journey himself. Uh, we touched on the experience of fundraising and their strategy um, and how they kind of approach that. Uh, overall, just really, really cool episode. And he even gave a special offer of some free value to any of the listeners at the end. So I have to tune in next time to hear that. Uh, that episode, we'll, we're, we're going to be doing a double week this week. So that should be coming out on Friday uh, if you're listening to this on Tuesday when we drop this episode. But uh, yeah, stay tuned for that episode with John. Really interesting conversation with him. Uh, and thank you again for joining us on Clean Techies, the podcast. We will see you next time.